the history of evolution has taught us. It's that life will not be contained. Life breaks free, it expands to new territories, and it crashes through barriers painfully, maybe even dangerously, but... Uh, well, there it is. There it is. You're implying that a group composed entirely of female animals will breed? No, I'm, I'm simply saying that life uh, finds a way. And uh, that was a clip from 1993's Jurassic Park. Uh, this is Jordan, and this is Movies the Podcast. And tonight I'm joined by... Curtis. Rob. Jenny. And uh, our ever-amazing producer, Fran. Stan. Stan. Dan the man. Jackie Chan. This is Jackie Chan. <laughs> That's racist. <laughs> you'll, you'll fit in nicely here. Um, so we are joined tonight by uh, Ginny in place of Brenda. Brenda is not with us tonight, so we give a shout-out to her. And she's a little uh, under the weather, so hopefully she gets. Well, by the time this airs, she'll be. Hopefully she's better by the time this airs. <laughs> we were going to have Jenny anyways. <laughs> yeah. we we just were we lucked out. We adopted her. Yeah. Um, but Jenny is here, and Jenny is uh, bringing an interesting perspective on movies. Uh, she's the writer of a blog called "I Want Yesterday," which focuses on women in film. Um, Jenny, can you tell us a little bit about your blog and what you write? I just feel like there's not enough information out there about women in film um, from a woman's perspective. Uh, so I decided to write a blog um, based off of the Natalie quote, the Natalie Wood quote. Um, it's, uh, someone asked her, what, did, what do you want? What do you need uh, today? And she said, I want yesterday. And th th that was right before she died. So I thought it was somber. <laughs> It's a somber tone. We appreciate that. What she needed was swimming lessons. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it is not Bam. too soon for Natalie. <laughs> what? I'm sorry. What? What? what it doesn't It fall? was 30 Natalie years ago. Was it only 30 years ago? 30 years. Oh, wow. Wow. 30 years, yeah. That's so weird. I know what she's talking about on her blog tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Misogyny, the podcast. <laughs> I meant this homosexual, and what he said, just... Who? Who's gay? Curls. Oh, yes, that's right. You know so what? we are here tonight... Um, so we are very glad to have Jenny tonight, and uh, we'll... Uh, Thank you, Jenny, for coming. Thank you. Uh, we will try to be nice and not run you out. <laughs> to screaming and yelling halfway through. Um, so before we'll just, we get we'll started... We'll just edit it. That's true. We'll, we'll dub in. Have we've learned, yeah. <laughs> but before we uh, start with tonight's uh, featured topic, uh, what has everyone been up to? Well, we've, I think we've all pretty much have caught a little bit of the new Arrested Development season. Uh, yes. Yes, I have. Yes, and like herpes, it's hard to cure. <laughs> really <laughs> uncomfortable. Yeah. I want to like it. I always tell Rob every time we talk about it, I want to like it. I want to think it's the funniest show I've ever seen. I want to teehee all the way, but it's just not funny to me, and it's just it's not, not my... I, I, now, are you a fan of the original seasons? I, ish. Like, I liked them. I think they're good. I watched them. I was like, oh, this is funny. Like, this is, this is good. Um... But no, I wasn't like, oh my god, they're coming back. But I watched it, um, and it's, to me, it's just the same of the old. I was one of the hardcore, can't wait that it's coming back. I've been posting me memes for weeks. Oh, really? I have been so excited. The Bluth the day. Bluth the day. <laughs> there is an app that you could text one of the characters, and they would text you the minute that Netflix released the episodes. Aww. Did they all text you? No. And, but I was really disappointed. I was, I was, I don't even think disappointed is the word. I think... A it gasped. fell flat. It was. It, they I, jumped the shark, then went back and raped the shark. I dis I, I disagree. I don't think they jumped the shark. I don't think they jumped the shark. I, I enjoy it. it they is, ran it over with, with stare. But what do you mean by jumped the shark? They <laughs> took it. Did somebody slip in the phrase rape culture in there? <laughs> no. <laughs> Someone has to speak for Brenda. I'm sorry. <laughs> And I will mean, be that voice. What do you mean jump the shark though? Because jump the shark means they've taken it too far. I feel like they're doing the same old shtick they they did yeah. before. Well, no, because I think the pattern is different. The 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 structure that's the, the structure is different. Yeah. But the structure was what was amazing about the original. True. But there was that pattern. What, and if there was if that you had read what signature. they were doing, is that each of them is meant to be a catch up of where these characters have been, yeah. leading up to a potential movie. So it's one of those where they're uh, once again taking that gamble as they did in the previous seasons. We're hoping we're going to continue the series. I would not watch that movie. I I honestly I totally would. <laughs> Well, did, I think, and mm. this is an interesting article, and I think it was on Hollywood Reporter, I was telling Rob about it. Their pay structure is very curious, and the way Netflix has budgeted them, there's a star of each episode, and that star gets the paycheck. 
And then if you notice the other cast members are in it for about 90 seconds, they get a small paycheck just for appearing in the episode. So it's a budget thing. I think that's the way it's structured the way it is, which is kind of sad in a way, but kind of, I guess, how the industry works now. It's well, it's a, it's a, it's but it does make a difference. It's a different industry. I mean, Netflix <laughs> is unique in the way it's, like we did, they did with House of Cards. They did with, yeah. uh, what's that horror one? Hemlock Grove. Hemlock Grove. It, yeah. It's just, it's a new way of approaching a series that and doesn't... It's, and it's interesting to see that there's a double-edged sword with that new production environment. It's not just total freedom. That it's not, that, that total freedom can go one way or the other. Mm -hmm. that, um, I'm going to finish the episodes and I will... I mean, I will. I've got nothing oh, else to watch. I'm sure I'm going to watch them again so after angry. I watch them. Yeah, I've only watched three. I just didn't want to continue it. But I'm going <laughs> to. I'm going to because I loyalty. love that show so yeah. much. But I don't know. At Watching three was enough for me right now, unfortunately. Well, and that's probably why they asked everybody not to binge watch it. I, and again, I don't understand. Then don't release them that way well, on Netflix. <laughs> Dan, you yeah, never have an opinion. That. I know, right? But no, as a guy who watched the entire thing because I'm fat and lazy... Um, I got to episode seven, it's and I know fun. that's like the cool thing to say. Episode seven's when it got better, but seriously, that's when it got better. It gets better, guys. Thank you for telling me now. <laughs> <laughs> Out of high school. Of, but wait, Dan, is that does season? Does is that when the the characters start really coming together as an ensemble? Because that's when it started to work. That's exactly it. okay. Yeah, okay. that's uh, that's when like you know, kind of everybody does their first episode, and then you really start understanding why. There's a big time gap, I guess. Everything kind of goes back in time and then forward in time. Yeah. And you start seeing them interact as a family, which is why the show works. Is because right. not not one of them are a solid lead. All together is a perfect show. Yep. Mm -hmm. J uh, Jason Bateman. He's yeah. a solid lead. That's he's a, the, your character that you watch. But, but you notice without the ensemble, he turns into a total douchebag. What? But you That's didn't notice yes, when he, he was does. immersed in the Because he's not the douchebag. He's the guy who's trying to save everything. Right. Oh, that does make sense. So it's just, it's like watching a half an hour of Jack that makes and me Karen. Sad. Do you know what I mean? I mean, just look much. at the relationship. Really, sorry. We're it's talking like, over each other unintentionally. It. Um, oh. it, what else? I know that one thing I watched um, was Behind the Candelabra on yes, HBO. I just watched it last night. So good. I There were some things that were a little off, um, and you could definitely <laughs> tell it was Soderbergh. Uh, but um, because halfway through, I was like, "Is it supposed to look like this?" Oh yeah, it's Soderbergh. The yellow light. It's supposed like it's always washed out, and yes. people are at a distance, and Curtis and I people were that are close are out of focus, and it's just right when Matt Damon was in the end was kind of poor, and he had the yellow lighting. I was like, "He uses the same lighting in Magic Mike." And they were like, "Because uh, he's poor, and that's his poor lighting." Like, oh yeah, it's like the Soderbergh's movie. lighting, like. Anytime you want to identify someone as a poor character, the lighting's yellow. Aaron Brockovich oh. had Aaron yellow Brockovich. lighting in a Magic Mike, the sister, and in traffic, the Mexico scenes were all in yellow. Like oh, that's the right. drug cartel scenes were yellow. Here's the thing I'll say about uh, Candelabra: I, I doubt you'll see a better male performance from those two. It's, Matt Damon had the harder role because it's more subtle, but I think. You know, uh, Michael Douglas had a really hard role. It was the best I've ever seen him. Well, also, Matt Damon's 40 playing. But he 19, did so good he playing. Did really, yes. He did really well. The I makeup it. in the film was. Just, I think they CG'd his face. Because they had Probably. to show. He's kind of soft. They had to show the aging between, you know, you you meet. What's his name? Liberace. <laughs> <laughs> you meet Liberace. Catherine Zeta Jones. It's Ooh. Catherine Zeta Jones and Michael Douglas' story. But they changed <laughs> the names to Liberace. <laughs> and Scott. <laughs> and Scott. Hello. But Wait, can we agree that <laughs> Rob Lowe's character was... <gasps> Rob Lowe's in it? He's hilarious. Well, first of all, when I first saw Rob Lowe come on screen, I said, my God, Lauren Bacall looks amazing. <laughs> <laughs> she has held up well. He had... How did His he character have... was meant to be like the go-to plastic surgeon of the time. Mm. So he had all this work. His character just plays up the fact that he's had all this work done. The makeup on him. He ended up looking like Lady <laughs> Elaine from he Mr. Did. Rogers' Neighborhood. No, the little he rosy cheek. He was just like, he looked he like a puppet. <laughs> it was, and it got progressively worse throughout the movie. Like, he completely lost his eye. Oh, and that he Liberace was so sleeping good. with his eyes open thing was creepy. Yeah. It, it was, was, it was a well acted movie. It was. It, I just wouldn't say it's a great movie. But the, right? the, biggest, the biggest thing that I was disappointed by is that it wasn't relatable at all. There's right. no character you were like. Did oh. you think that you would find many things in the Liberace love death story? But even in all those biopics, there's somebody where you're like, 
you're rooting for? Yeah. And this wasn't What's Love Got to Do With It. <laughs> I know. Scott didn't, like, leave the limo with a bloody eye. He <laughs> left it with a bag of cocaine <laughs> and some jewelry. I thought it was interesting, though, at the end. Um, I mean, it's a true story, so people know what happened to these people. But Heart they, failure. They're... <laughs> Yes. Spoiler, spoilers. <laughs> Liberace dies of AIDS. I don't know. I didn't want to He's ruin it gay. for anyone. But I thought it was interesting that they didn't really give an epilogue on what happened to Scott because he actually went to prison twice. He's had, and one of the characters from the movie, um, his drug dealer was involved in the Wonderland murders what? and went what? to prison. And Scott went into witness protection because he testified against the gang from the so Wonderland correct. murders. I'm obsessed with the Wonderland murders. Yeah, so it was um, It was just interesting they didn't mention that. I know the focus was Liberace and it wasn't really... I just thought it would be interesting that that could have just... You but know, that would have opened the door with for a lot more... A sequel. Oh. <laughs> well, it was just... It was very self-contained. It was, it was true, very low true. budget. It was. and But it was, it was very good. And I think Michael Douglas definitely has Emmy But you know he's going to be up against Kevin Spacey. Which is, you know, which is good for, for, for people watching television and people like it's a good year like we're, we've got these amazing yeah. performances to, to really appreciate no I completely agree and I finished Mad Men I know we're kind of on TV but I finally finished don't say anything because I haven't finished it yet I'm on season 5 he's, oh. he's on season 5 I just finished season 5 oh, I haven't even seen season 6 so. I know oh my god um, I enjoy everything about that show especially the women so has anyone seen Star Trek I've seen it twice in the theater now. I've started You've watching the it original twice series. Yeah. <gasps> You've started the watching the original series? Yeah. How much time do you have on your hands? A lot. I'm unemployed, Rob. <laughs> God, Rob. <laughs> that wasn't, I wasn't. <laughs> I just finished school. God damn it. Can I get a job? <laughs> I started, the other night I must have hit up some friends yet on the way home, and I started trying to watch Voyager. I'm like, I'm going to watch Every Voyager episode. No. <laughs> Nobody watched no. every Voyager episode. Oh, I know. Not even the cast of Voyager. Really <laughs> the production uh, team was like, we'll just watch it later. Our <laughs> friends Justin and Chris, they watched Next Generation, and they started Voyager, and then they stopped. And I, was like, I was like, well, maybe Deep Space. So you started the original? Like, like Captain Kirk. Shatner. Yeah. Wow. 1950. How many seasons was that? Only three. Four or five? No, the first one was only three. Really? Yeah. Because oh. they almost canceled it. That's right. And then brought it back just for two more seasons. I know, it's weird to think. It's that iconic of a show. And do you know Star Trek's only been around for 50 years? Seems like it's And it really just longer. redefined. You know, Brady Bunch wasn't on the air very long, and it was a it was yeah. a flop. So it was Gilligan's Island. Like, there are a lot of those what? shows. The that, Monsters? Right. Uh, yeah. Gilligan's Island was canceled for low ratings because I, nobody <laughs> watched it when it How aired. long can that premise really go? Well, Gilligan's Island? Lost. Ever. I don't know how many, episodes, how many seasons was lost. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> I just wanted to find out that Gilligan and Ginger were going to be going to heaven together at the end. Shows back then weren't like this deep plot. It was like, Gilligan can't find the coconuts, you know? It was like like that kind of stuff. Again. Again. (laughs) Gilligan, where are the coconuts? I don't know. That's my And that, that, that's, uh, that's stretched out for 30 minutes of an episode. They do, but no, they were only like 20, 20 something. I mean, they... That's how TV worked back then. Yeah. Now I watch One Hour Mad Men, and when the episode ends, I'm like, what is happening? <laughs> that, that producer does not want you to get a handle on those characters. Mm-mm. Well, kind of talking about Star Trek kind of leads us into our topic for the podcast tonight. What are we talking about? We are talking about science fiction. I um, love secret topics. <gasps> secret topics. We didn't know that we were going to record this till tonight. Surprise! surprise. Um, you would think, because of all the preparation I did for it, that <laughs> we found out ten minutes ago that we were going on the air. I'm so glad this show isn't live. Um, isn't it? Don't get any ideas. <laughs> or that we have a studio audience that could throw things. Um, do it. Oh, yeah, we've talked about I, it. Uh, yeah. I wanted to host uh, science fiction because I am a sci-fi person. Um, I'm one of those people that would describe themselves as a sci-fi geek. Um, and I know that there are people in this room that do not describe themselves that way. And so that would be interesting to have a little discussion about science fiction and the role that it has played in, in movies because it has been such an amazing force in in movies and in literature and the literature that turns into movies um we were talking a little bit off air about science fiction and what makes science fiction science fiction um so i looked up a quote from robert heinlein who's considered um he's an author and he's considered the father of science fiction and he kind of laid out the groundwork of what is science fiction versus fantasy and what is science fiction versus what is horror and the key to science fiction and why the science part of it comes into it is that it's always a premise that's probable. It takes a current technology, pushes it to the next step. It takes a current trend in society, pushes it to another step. 
It's human-based. Um, he uses the example that if he made a movie about Earthlings being descended from Martians, that's fantasy, because that can't possibly be an extension of what we already know, because then you couldn't explain apes. You couldn't explain Earth evolution. But if you write a story about people leaving Earth and going to Mars to colonize, that's science fiction. That is an extension of something that is real in our world. And I think that's why science fiction really resonates with a lot of people, because it is something very relatable. We were talking about how science fiction really crosses genres. It crosses its political, its social commentary, its comedy, its horror, its, its suspense, political um, theories, it, its romance. Um, you know, and, and you can do so many different things with it. So I kind of wanted to throw it out to our castmates tonight. Um, of kind of, you know, when when I say to them, what is what is science fiction that you really love, or what is it that comes to mind when you think of science fiction? What is that, and what is that experience? And I think that some people listening to might um, begin to think of themselves as a little bit more of science fiction fans than they thought. So, um, Jenny, do you want to start with uh, your pick? I picked Blade Runner. I think it's an obvious choice, but I love that movie. It's an obvious choice because it's a really freaking good movie. It's still good. Yeah, and it really holds up. And it has really strong female characters in it, which I enjoy. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Oh, it kind of does. It Even does. The, and Sean Young's such a terrible actress, but I think she's amazing in that. Though. But they know she's how amazing, to use yeah. her. They know how to like prop her the right way. There's it's some sci-fi movies, not all of them, have done that where they know an archetype. And they're like, let's take you and let's. And I always forget about um, not the Daryl Hannah character. Oh, um, the, the snake, snake woman. Yes. Oh, what's her name? I, I know Joanna Cassidy's her name in real life, but um, I don't know her name. Her I don't remember name. her character's name. But either. she's awesome. Like she kicks ass in that. Yeah, so. she leaves an impression. That, that movie for the longest time, I always thought that it was famous or just so well loved because of the technology and the the. Just that the way it was set, when the time period was set, and that it was it was groundbreaking for its special effects. And when I finally saw it, that wasn't the case at all. I mean, it had amazing set pieces. It had this. Uh, that still hold up. It, but it holds up because of the story, and it just blew my mind that this movie. Like for me, I Brazil is a movie that I'm not a huge fan of, but I think it holds up because of how visually stunning the film is. Blade Runner to me holds up because of the story, and you just get the satisfaction of all these visuals behind this film. But that's what makes, you know, <clears throat> good sci-fi from great sci-fi, because Blade Runner has a lot of intellectual ideas. It has a lot of uh, poetry, for lack of a better word. It has a lot of themes that it's not just, let's uh, run from someone trying to get us, because that's where it converge into horror. And I think, to me, that is, that in 2001 are the best sci-fis, for very different reasons. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, but I know, like, I have a friend, Justin, who loves sci-fi and does not like Blade Runner. Does not find any, um, I don't know, if he was here, he would be able to explain it better than me. But um, doesn't find any merit in it. So I always think it's strange when people don't like it. It's interesting you choose, you're kind of juxtaposing those two movies because they're very, they're very op polar opposites, mm -hmm. I think. for In, in sci-fi, you have those movies that are very clean and crisp and... And Blade Runner is so austere. dirty. Yeah. And Blade Runner is very dirty. It's gritty. Yeah. It's it's it's, but it's like the, urban. It's it, like it the old Star Trek and the old Star Wars. Star For Wars sure. Trek was very clean, and Star Wars yeah. was very dirty. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, it's different. It's all the same. But yeah. um, Rob, what was what was something that you had thought of when we we threw that out? I mean, I think there's a lot of great sci-fi films, and like Curtis said, there's films that are good and some that are great, and. That I was making a list of films that I, I really enjoy that had that sci-fi element behind it, especially the way you just put that, how the, the difference between how sci-fi, your opinion of how sci-fi was perceived, not necessarily your opinion, but the way you stated that. Um, to me, I, I'm a big fan of, uh, I've talked about this before, but uh, Philip Kaufman's, uh, not Philip, it's Philip Kaufman, right? Philip Kaufman, yeah. Philip Kaufman's Invasion of the Body Snatchers with, He's making f movies. No, that was the there. that was the one I was gonna say. So. Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Oh, Rob, Rob just had me watch that a couple months ago. Uh, uh, I literally that. watched that just a couple months ago. Also, uh, it's it's phenomenal and it scares the bejesus me, out of me every time. Um, but I, you know, going through the list, the original Day of the Earth Stood Still. That movie holds up so beautifully. Watching that again, but uh, you know, to me, I think sci-fi is a genre that 
it's 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 it can be so dismissed so easily, mm-hmm. but it's a genre that it takes what's worked in other films, it takes what's worked in other stories, and can make it still awe inspiring. You still can watch movies and be like, blo- like the Star Trek, the not the second one, but the first one, Close Encounters. Close Encounters. But when oh, the yeah. the remake of Star Trek came out, you you knew what this world was, you knew what these characters were, especially that they're re they're relaunching an existing franchise, but it still left you in awe of what they did with it. So and, and you really, I think, you touch on what I think is very unique about science fiction, is that it's able to comment on society in a way that other genres are not able to. And uh, you know, you mentioned the the uh, the day the Earth stood still, which is a, a commentary on nuclear war and a commentary on environmentalism, made at a time before those voices against those movements. It's been a way throughout history for writers and, produ- and directors and uh, screenwriters and, and novelists to comment on society in a way that gets their message through but isn't on the nose. Um, and that's one of the things, um, you know, Star Wars really tapped a nerve in 77 when it came out because of, you know, corruption in the government. You had, you know... Uh, but I don't think that's why it tapped the nerve. I think so. I think it, it really I, kind I, of... I think what it... Well, it was escapist, but it is escapist with... a point. point. Kind of like aliens or something like that. And you know, and I just went to, just uh, recently in Houston, we had uh, Galacticon 3, because I'm a, it was my first con to ever go to, and it was amazing. Nerd. Battlestar Galactica fans, and I, I, I met Edward James Olmos, and what? it was amazing, speaking oh, of uh, Blade Runner. Oh, he's now. <laughs> oh, he was in Stan. Yeah, he was in Blade Runner, he was Gaff. Um, and Zora is the, Zora. Uh, Joanna Cassidy's name. Um, the, uh, but one of the points he made, a lot of the, the speakers that, that we went to these panels were talking about is that Something like Battlestar Galactica, which is a TV show, um, and on the surface, it's sci- it's people shooting each other in space, and it's you know corny romantic lines. But it came out at really at the beginning of the Iraq War, and it really spoke to that commentary that was going on in America about trusting your government, um, trusting each other, um, you know, terror that looks like you, and those kinds of those those very subtle things that were spoken to, and it wasn't on the nose, and they didn't say this is exactly like. Bush going into Iraq. It was very, very subtle, and I think that, that that does resonate with people, maybe even on a subconscious level. I'm glad you said that, and I'm glad you said earlier, because the ones that I kind of thought of for sci-fi, I mean, I obviously Blade Runner in 2001, Space Odyssey are great, but I picked ones, and you made the perfect definition, or Heinlein did, that it's something that's happening now, but kind of pushed into the future. Um, for me, and I was just asking you too, The Stepford Wives mm-hmm. is very, it's yes. wonderful. Ira yeah. Levin understood the terror that, and that is kind of science fiction. It's what was happening at the time. You know, women, yeah. feminism really making a rise, and men being so terrified. Yeah. And I feel like that, and then more recently, Children of Men. Oh, which for sure. We always forget how great that movie is because it kind of fell to the wayside. But it's sci-fi, right? I mean, it's... That is science fiction. takes what was could happen and took it even further. Um, so I like those, and I never really thought of them as science fiction. I just thought of them yeah. as social I'm commentary. Gonna, I'm going to take that from you. So I'm going to claim Children of Men, and you can have my... What did I, I adore <laughs> Children of Men. I do. It's, it's so and it's fantastically made. I'll, I'll, I'll give you my Galaxy Quest. You can have that one. Take it. And a yeah. lot of uh, science fiction is is, dysto- is dystopic. It mm-hmm. is very yes. bleak. It's, it's a, a lot about destruction and a lot about death and genocide and... You know, Children of Men is, is definitely an example of a society just gone to the shitter. Oh, my God. You say that, and I'm looking through my list. I'm like, oh, AI, Independence Day, District 9, <laughs> like, oh, Wally. But I wanted to say, when we talk about sci-fi, my mind goes straight to, and I always say it's like the um, Tom Cruise, Steven Spielberg movies, like the Minority mm-hmm. Report, uh, War of the Worlds. Like, oh, War I, of the I, World. I love the World. I, l- I do. I love that. I, I want to say those movies, but when we started really talking about sci-fi, yeah. the ultimate is 2001 and Blade Runner. It's very interesting, too, to look at. You know, I keep reiterating that. We're but talking about <laughs> our recommendations <laughs> this week are Blade Runner, which we should watch. We should screen that. That should be our next screening. I've never seen it in the theater. So that's how I, saw it I never saw it in the theater. theater either. 2001 in the theater, you feel like you're the smartest person on the planet. Oh like you're goodness. the only one that gets it. <laughs> and huh. I feel like that every time I listen to The Smiths. Uh, me too. <laughs> the saddest person. The saddest. <laughs> they're speaking right to me. This is me. I wrote um, this. But talking about Star Trek too, you know, it's you know, Star Trek is about you know, you know, it's it's got some war elements. It's got all of that, but it's also it's really, I think, utopian, in the way that you you have this future that has no religion. You have this future that has men and women. No money. Equal. There's no money. Society. It's it's the socialism, and you see that these 
that that kind of a world where men and women are equal, races are equalized, there's no more fiat money system, and these amazing cities are built and they're able to, this technology that they embrace. And that was kind of Ray Bradbury. Um, Elysium? Ray Bradbury, Gene Roddenberry. <laughs> Not Ray Bradbury, but also Ray Bradbury, but uh, Gene Roddenberry's vision for the original Star Trek was that science would, and his idea, and Carl Sagan said this in, in Asimov, that science would release us from those things that are keeping us from manifesting the greatness of humanity, which is religion, greed, racism, gluttony. <laughs> greed, hatred, all of those things would be fixed with science. And that's what a lot of those visionaries felt. And that was the hope of, of that wave of science and science fiction writing um, was that, you know, we would have robots and we would have space travel and it would save the world and we would use technology to become better people. Um, and it's interesting that sci-fi goes in those two different directions. It either goes to that utopian place or to a very dark, dark, dark place like Oblivion where the entire species has been destroyed. A Wally. -E. Or Wally -E, where the entire species has gone to Walmart. Like Elysium. <laughs> Um, God, the Walmart. That's, Wall -E I know, is, I love oh, it. Oh, it kind of is. They do go to Walmart. They go to Walmart. It's why it's called Wall-E. It's social commentary. Get on the ball. <laughs> um, Rob didn't read his Cliff's notes. Somebody didn't read his homework that I sent everyone. But oh, I, I get I mine. No, I, I just sent it to email. Oh, oh, it's Yeah, weird. the email is sci-fi as well. I put it on Jenny's blog. He sent it straight to Friendster. <laughs> And as soon as she figures out the address for it, she can read it. It's somewhere, I swear. <laughs> it's iwantyesterday.blogspot.com. Yes, and we will make sure to plug that again. Wait, is it really? And yes. Wait, wait, and we yeah, will, uh, that's, that's, I and we'll be sure to plug it on our sites as well. Yeah. Um, so what, um, just kind of throwing it out there, because I know that as a kid, sci-fi was a big part of my childhood. Um, you know, I was reading the Tolkien books before he, you know, before the movies, before all of that, when I was a little kid, those... I really loved that fantasy, and I loved um, Star Wars was amazing, and was a big part of my of my childhood, and um, those kinds of movies. So, what were uh, some of your earliest memories of science fiction? Because I think Jim those... Henson. Oh yeah, does like Labyrinth, Dark Crystal, Dark Crystal. I've never those seen would be Dark more like Crystal. fantasy, but I think too. But and I think fantasy and sci-fi really shooting us down, Jordan. Really they can go hand in hand. Go hand yeah. in hand, and they're Jurassic part of this. I mean, Jurassic Park is definitely, it's 20 years old. I cannot believe it. I watched it When we saw night. the trailer and they go, for the 20th anniversary, I was like, oh, my God. I was so old. But 20 it's really good. years old. Um, I watched it twice recently. Just like, it was just, it's been on, like, what, nonstop. What, what, what's the movie that, sorry, not to, what's the movie that you would just die in 20 years? You're like, that's celebrated its 20th anniversary this year? Like it was Spring Breakers, like 20th um, edition. The Sapphires. I know I'm going to be there for the 20th anniversary. Oh, for the remaster. <laughs> for the remaster. Well, when they talk about American Beauty is, what, 10, 15? 15, 15? 17 years. That's ridiculous. Yeah. I can remember one from my childhood. I don't know if you guys have ever seen it. Uh, Explorers. No. Like the, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. With, with um, River Phoenix, Ethan Hawke, and some yes. kid you never see ever again. Jerry O'Connell. Oh, wow. No. No. <laughs> No, he's yeah. in that other movie. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> no, that's I remember that movie. That's oh my god, that movie. movie changed my life as a Mac child. Mac and Me. Oh, Mac and Me. We and tried to forget I them. Bootleg E.T. <laughs> it was so cute. But do you think about a lot of the blockbusters? It was bootleg E.T. <laughs> for all of us, you know, the 80s. I was Mexican. That's all I grew up on is bootlegs. <laughs> Rob is only Mexican at this podcast. So I just want everyone to know. Please. Take off the sombrero. <laughs> I picked it up at the flea market. <laughs> Let's rug. Um, but I know that a lot of the blockbusters from the 80s when I was a kid were science fiction, like E.T., Back to the Future. Those were the movies yeah. that were really, you know, packing in Star Wars, um, you know. So that was, those were those movie-going experiences that were really, um, were really meaningful. Oh, you know, oh, Dan, Dan has a question. Yes, Dan. It wasn't, I, I can wait. Dan, now we've already interrupted everything. No, we're here. What we're here for you, Dan. So I, I just want to kind of throw it out there, and then I'll shut up for the rest of the podcast. <sighs> Curtis, <sighs> I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> um, my sci-fi, when growing up as a child, primarily came from comic books, a lot of them. And um, I just want to make a small note that uh, yesterday morning, uh, it was announced that Glenn Close is going to be playing in the James Gunn movie uh, Guardians of the Galaxy <laughs> as shut the leader up. of the Nova Corps. What does that even Gert, mean? Yeah, geek vomit right here. Albert Knobs? Yeah. 
I don't know what any of that is. But oh, I'm gonna look it up. That's I didn't know that. I hadn't heard that. James Gunn doing. I saw that she was announced. Well, I know that she's James Gunn's doing. There's gonna be raccoon shooting guns. You know what? When they make Fatal Attraction two, call me. Gunn is. Who's James Gunn? I know that name. He did the zombie video game, Zombie Cheerleader. Video oh, game. Okay. oh yeah, that's the whole script for that. You remember that? He Curtis. sounds fantastic. Yeah. We um, played that while we were waiting for Sex and the City. I, I, to I start. like Glenn Close. Anything with Glenn Close. I'll and listen. back into the darkness. I guess. Except, yeah. except for Albert Knobs. What I was saying. <laughs> sorry. Uh, my fr- the first movie I ever saw was The Abyss. My mom took oh, me to God. see it when I was a kid, and I remember falling asleep. And you don't remember being terrified? I was like, I must have been five. But my mom trained us to go to the movies. Like when yeah. we were little kids, she would Me just take too. us to the movies. You know, and you just, you learn to shut up and watch it. And sometimes you watch it, sometimes you fall asleep. But I remember falling asleep and waking up when the the um, alien was creating the faces, remember? And I thought, oh my God, what is this? <laughs> um, but yeah, so she took me to that. It must've been a late, late showing. She probably assumed I'd fall asleep, so. There you go, Mom. She's like, I don't care. I'm going to take these kids with me. She uh, did. No, she didn't. I remember when she took my little brother to see a movie when he was probably a couple months. And I was like, are you serious? And she's like, that's how I taught you guys. And it was cast away. And he uh-huh. slept the whole time. Because oh the water. Oh. It's very soothing when they crash the 747 <laughs> into the water. When he's taking the shoes off the dead captain. That's real soothing. Captain Phillips. I dreamed a dream. <laughs> So and I know that um, so coming up this summer we've got some some big sci-fi coming out which will have already come out by the time you hear this. You might get them on Blu-ray, um, but you can get them on. You or can get them up at the flea market. Mm-hmm. You could, um, Don't encourage that. No, no, I won't encourage that. <laughs> you could, I have a friend uh, who works at a theater. Oh, I don't. <laughs> you don't have any. No, no. that's a shit job. <laughs> um, I, I hang out with real people. I'm just kidding. Where were they this week? At River Oaks Theater. Um, (laughs) Demolishing it? At Edward. Picking up the ashes? I'm just kidding, Rob. I love you. Um, But Man of Steel was coming out, which I really love, because Superman, the original Superman. That's one of the things I watched. I watched Superman Superman 2 a couple of days ago. It is so bad. Not the Richard Donner cut. Not the Richard Donner cut. I, I've never seen the director, uh, the Richard Donner. It's still original. cheesy, but it's, yeah. I mean, it's cheesy. It's so good, but you can't buy Margot Kidder as a romantic lead. I'm sorry. I do. You I would. love Margot Kidder. You would. Because she's not the t- <laughs> because she's not the typical girly girl that you like the Kate Bosworth. I mean, come on. Oh, she was Fuck terrible. Kate Bosworth. Thank you. <laughs> and somebody like even Amy Adams, I buy her as a romantic lead, but Margot Kidder just yes. seems so left of center that I love that he's from a strange but you know world what? but remember she's strange he when we care about beauty but when we talked about um, The Shining we talked about Shelley Duvall's casting mm-hmm. was versus perfect. Jessica Lange Cupid Lang. doll Jessica Lange you know blonde you know bombshell and that really worked to service the that character and that, that characters uh, Margot, that Margot characters just seems driven. plucky and spunky it's because she's Canadian mm, she's from the Yukon Yukon um, what other summer releases, other sci-fi releases are this year? I saw the trailer for Gravity. Is it Gravity? We saw it, yeah. With Sandra Bullock and yeah. uh, George, George Clooney. Clooney. I'm not. That looked really... Uh, I'll go and I went, I went with my it's boyfriend to see, um, to see Star Trek. I went with him the second. I had seen it already, and I went with him to see it for the first time. During that trailer, he was on the edge of his seat. Because he is a real Star Trek. A Star Trek. He's a real uh, sci-fi nerd. Um, and he was just really engrossed in that. So, I mean, it's just a really good trailer. I don't, I don't know. The movie could be shit, but... It's a film to grow on. He, this is his first film since Children of Men. It needs to be in IMAX I, in 3D. I, there's no other way I'm going to see it, that. It intrigued me. I definitely It's the same see director? It. Yeah, oh, but he that. went through... When they were making that movie, he went through the casting. People were turning him down left and right. And finally, he settled on Sandra Bullock. So the part was originally, and this is all in the press, it was given, offered Angelina Jolie, who said no. Offered to a couple more people, they all said no. Offered to Natalie Portman, said no. Offered to a couple more, so he just kept trying to give it to people, and finally he's like, Sandra Bullock, what are you doing next week? Do you want to be in my 3D movie? <laughs> it's going to film for a week, and then I'll do post on it for two years. Like, I mean, that's, yeah, kind, of, been... that's kind of what it was, and so I'm not optimistic. To cover up her bad acting? 
Ugh. Slap that Oscar out of her hand. Seriously. Second worst Oscar win. But anyways. Oh, not being the first. Jennifer Lawrence. I being absolutely the first. agree. <gasps> Love as good as it goes. So you would. well, she shouldn't have won that year. But yeah. come on, give it to me. Yeah. Um, Helena Bonham. <laughs> because have Jessica won. Chastain, his sister, should it's have my won. Cousin. Uh, oh, my cousin. Oh, cousin. We're not. We're not that close. We do have some. There are some big um, sci-fi films coming out this this summer. The Purge, which I'm really mm. looking forward to. Isn't which that is, horror? It's sci-fi. It's current social trend taken to its extreme. Thank you, Robert Heinlein. And uh, Hunger Games, Pacific like. Rim, which I feel I saw when it was called yes. Godzilla. I can't wait <laughs> no, for that. I can't Are you wait. serious? I can't Why wait. do we like I can't wait Guillermo. to not see it. That's fine. I won't invite you when I screen it. Unless it's a porn called I'm Pacific not, Rim, I, I'm not interested. That okay? Asian one. Yeah, with all those Filipinos. Um, I just don't like Guillermo del Toro. I've never seen anyone do that with a plantain. What? They were talking about how he Thank directed you. he directed Blade 2, and I was like, oh, I didn't like Blade 2. Oh, I never saw that. That's good. Isn't it? I like Blade 3. But, um... Yeah, I never like anything he does. So when Rob was so excited, I saw the trailer and I was like, oh, that's really good. Have you ever seen Kronos? Is that how you pronounce it? No, that's oh one of his I've not God. seen. You okay. have to see that. It's he on did, Hulu he did Plus. Mimic, too. <laughs> I like Mimic. I have never seen that. He did, though? He, he did, did Kronos, then that. Mimic, I think. Mm -hmm. oh. Then Blade. Okay, I'll watch Kronos. Kronos, oh, so good. I'm, I'm, a, big, I'm, a, I'm a bit completist. If I'm going to say I don't like Especially somebody, if you're into vampires, like, he takes a vampire legend and does something really cool with Why it. Why is everything else he does so bad? Hellboy 2 is amazing. I love Hellboy. Yeah. I'll go, you know, I'll see anything. I don't care, but um, <laughs> I'll groan afterwards. Or I'll love it. Who knows? Who knows? I like to be surprised. And the lead actor, uh, Charlie Hunnam. Was he the guy from Queer Stuff? Yes, yes, Queer's that's him. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he can act. Mm -hmm. He's the guy from Sons of Anarchy. Yes. Isn't he? So, okay, he's so gotten hard. better over the years. Sorry, sorry. He's at least getting paid more. True. <laughs> so I looked at you when I made the sound. <laughs> I was wondering why you apologized. I'm going, what, 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 what I miss? Um, is that the only sci-fi coming out? Okay, so Crimson. Well, World War Z is also coming out, which I'm feeling uh, about. But I'm going to like the director. I like, Mark, I like Mark Forster. I like yeah. Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt, as of late, has I, been doing some good work. I, yeah, for sure. And I, I'm going to see it. For sure. I know the zombie thing is kind of played out, I feel. But you, I didn't tell you. Um, I know this is a sci fi. But um, we just found out that we're booked to play the new Almodovar. Which is called. I'm, I'm so, so excited. excited. Oh, I am so excited, but what's it called? <laughs> Who's on first? <laughs> Nerds. And, and scene. And scene. Um, so, um, dead air, dead I'm, air, dead insert air. Insert clip here. Well, we haven't gotten our hand signals down yet. Um, also because I'm not paying attention. But, Jordan's um, just learning how to wrap it up. I, am, I never wrap it up. I learned, that, I learned that in the Philippines. Oh. So anyway. Um, that means sex, everybody. For those of you in Iowa, that means <laughs> sex. sex. That's not a plantain. Anyway. Um, so where this can, is where can you find us online? Rap, we are wrapping this up right now before the censors. Where can you find us online? We are everywhere online. You should find us on Facebook. We're also on YouTube. We're on Instagram. Instagram. We're on. What else? We're Soon on Twitter. the Twitter. We got the Twitter. We're are on we the, twatted? We're twatting all over. We will be all over the greater Houston area. And then, of course, our our, our fabulous guest tonight, um, Jenny, with her blog, which is located. At Curtis, you said it. Before. I want yesterday.blogspot.com. So check Thank that you. out, or just Google search "I want yesterday." Come on, yeah. do that, and uh, also My like Nana her Googles. Facebook page, and oh, yeah. hopefully all of her fans will like our page, and vice versa. Um, so uh, thanks for joining us, and I hope uh, this was as much fun for you as it was for me. Where's my paycheck? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. No, really. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Ta -ta. guys.